Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the L. Ron Hubbard Theater in Hollywood, California. Tonight we present a live broadcast of the Golden Age Radio Hour featuring L. Ron Hubbard's Western romance, When Gilhooly Was in Flower. Jigsaw Gilhooly was a thousand miles deep in thought, which fact was not particularly endearing him to Mary Ann Marlowe. He sat on her front porch, looked off into the purple expanses and gnawed upon a wheat straw. He looked idiotic when he sat like that, thought Mary Ann. His eyes got out of focus, and uh, he, he was limp enough normally, but now... Uh, Apparently, he was a sober-faced, gangling, walking stick of a puncher without any sense of humor. But Gilhooly had ideas. He had big ideas. And right now, he was wondering just how to get around to fixing life so that he could ask Mary Ann to be his forevermore. Disgustedly, Mary Ann, who taught school to three kids in Gunpowder Gulch, picked up her copy of Ivanhoe and tried to read to get her mind off the way Gilhooly looked when he was jigsawing. Most of the men in Painted Butte's country had told her she was beautiful. She believed them a little, and therefore it grieved her that Gil Hooley paid her such scant attention. Most of the men in the Painted Butte's country told her she, she was a fool for seeing anything in Jigsaw Gil Hooley, as he had neither looks nor fortune nor reputation. And little Mary Ann was beginning to believe them a little. Gil Hooley sat and chewed his straw and focused his eyes on the back of his head, thus circumnavigating the globe with a blink. <laughs> his problem was somewhat complex. He had 300 acres of his own and a square mile of range rented. He had 40 head of cattle. He had a house which could stand both straightening and improvement. Several gentlemen had lately offered him a fancy price, and he thought maybe he ought to sell and get another place before he asked Marianne. And that was not all. These gentlemen were sheep men. If sheep got a foothold on the Painted Buttes range, there wouldn't be any stopping them. Now, it was either asking Mary Ann to marry on two dollars and staying loyal to his kind, or it was asking Mary Ann to marry on fifteen hundred dollars and going in debt for a place good enough for her. So the problem shifted back and forth, and so did the straw. And Gil Hooley kept his eyes on the back of his head via China. Stop it! Gil Hooley looked at her in astonishment. Stop looking like such a shorthorn. Jigs, Gil Hooley, sometimes I think you are a fool. And the other times, well, I'm certain of it. <laughs> Ma'am? Why don't you be a man? Why do you have to sit and moon about some crazy problem when you rode 15 miles to see me? That's right. What's right? I did ride 15 miles to see you. Ivanhoe was clutched in her small, desperate hand. She felt like throwing it at him. Well, now you're mad. I didn't mean to do anything. What's wrong? Oh, the trouble with you, Jigs Gilhooly is that you aren't romantic. Me? You. <laughs> but... He stopped. He was baffled. I, what do you mean, romantic? Like... Like Brian Du Bois Gilbert or Ivanhoe. Well, I, 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 like who? Nobody by them names has a spread around here. Well, of course they haven't. Their outfits are over in England and... France and places. Huh. Yeah. Foreigners. <laughs> Foreigners or not, Jigs Gilhooly. If you ever expect me to pay any attention you might have to make, you'll have to mend your ways. And that's final. You mean be romantic? But, but gee, Marianne, I don't know anything about that. An inspiration hit her. She closed the book with a thump and handed it to him. When you've read this, you can come back and see me. And not until. 
Gil Hooley was routed. He took the book as though it had a rattler between the colors. <laughs> Held away from him, looking at it. But when he looked back at Marianne, he could see with but half an eye that she had meant what she said. Now, th this was a new angle to the problem. He hadn't thought about her not wanting to marry him. But the solution was offered. He would have to read this book and be romantic. He tipped his hat. Yes, ma'am. And backed off the porch. He climbed his Mustang, Calico, tipped his hat again to Mary Ann, and neck reined away to proceed down the wagon tracks through the sagebrush. When he was about a mile or so from the house, still in view behind him, he told Calico, Pick your own gopher holes to fall into. I got some studying to do. And so it was that Jigsaw Gil Hooley began to read of the days when knighthood was in flower. <laughs> Two bits worth of midnight oil later, Jigs Gil Hooley guided Calico onto the field of honor. Pennons fluttered, queens waved, and armor flashed all about him. Mary Ann threw a glove toward him for an amulet, and then, drawing up and lowering the shade of his visor, he glared through the slits at Brian Dubois Gilbert, who stood snorting evilly on the other side of the tilt course. It happened at this time that a gentleman by the name of Fallon, who was known for determination, and his friend Dwight Billings Dwight topped the bluff above the Gilhooley Ranch. What the devil? Said Fallon thickly, pulling in and staring. Billings Dwight stared too. Well, he must be plumb loco, Fallon. Maybe I better pot shot him with this here sharps, huh? Yeah. Put it away. Below them in a flat field, Gil Hooley sat upon a much altered calico, a, a fly net decked the horse. But that was not the most astonishing thing about his ensemble. Gil Hooley had a long pine pole in his hand with something which looked like a, a boxing glove on the far end. He had twisted his holster around so that he could couch his crude lance. On his head, he had a water pail with holes in front <laughs> and something which appeared to be a, a hearse plume bobbing above it. Thirty yards away, a longhorn bull pawed earth and blew and was not particularly aware that he was no one but Brian Dubois Gilbert. Sir Gil Hooley tensed in his saddle. He lowered his lance, he jabbed spur to a nervous calico, and they lunged ahead straight at the halong horn. Calico's hoofs thundered. Sir Gil Hooley yelled. Hello! The bull started a rolling charge of his own. Two irresistible forces met in mid-flight. The lance hit the bull's shoulder just as the longhorn swerved. The impact picked Sir Gil Hooley out of the saddle like a pebble from a slingshot. And then like a pole vaulter's pole, it arced Sir Gil Hooley through the air. He swooped to a loud landing 30 feet beyond the Longhorn. The bull turned and saw his man dismounted. He started to charge. Horns lowered. But Calico was a trained cow pony, and like all such, riderless or no, he would ride down a bull. He streaked in from the right, shoulder to shoulder with a racing Longhorn. The bull was not bright. He thought, he thought this was another rider. He swerved away, and Calico dived in towards Sir Gil Hooley, who grabbed the horn and swung aboard. He scowled at the bull. <laughs> That's only ten times. But, Sir Brian, we shall meet in mortal combat yet again. Up on the ridge, Fallon and Billings Dwight were agape with wonder. I tell you, I better pick him off before he... No, nah, nah. no murder in this deal yet. They spurred forward and trotted down into the pasture. Somewhat confused, Gil Hooley turned to meet them. He didn't know what to do with the lance, and so he made a useless attempt to hide the 20-foot pine stick behind his back. <laughs> Hello! Gil Hooley nodded. He, he did not like sheep men, and he especially did not like Billings, Dwight, and Fallon. But just now he was uh, red of face. Yeah? Oh, Gil Hooley, we came over to see if you were going to sell us uh, this place and, and give us that lease. Uh, I, I ain't decided. You mean you won't? Well, 
I've been thinking it over. Right? It would be a damn shame to let sheep on this range. I got the only water for 25 miles around that's worth anything. All the cattlemen have to use my wells. If there was sheep on this place, the cows wouldn't come within a mile of the troughs if they was dying of thirst. Fallon, I think maybe it would be a mistake to let you have this place for any money. Fallon stayed the black rage which began to rise within him. <laughs> well, you know what might happen to you, Gil Hooley. Maybe. But it would take more than a pair of buzzards to do it. <laughs> Fallon turned to his friend. Uh, come on, Billings. He's crazier than we thought. As they rode away, they were conscious of Gil Hooley's eyes upon their backs. You think he's nutty? Nah. It's that Mary Ann Marlowe. Oh, that's my guess. And I think I'm right. I'll say. You don't want no murder, because we got to keep our noses clean or we won't get no money. Yeah, no murder. And if we can get Gilulia's wells, we can buy out the rest of this range for a song because the money will be coming fast. We can hire a young army to keep them punchers off on us. Yeah. What you driving at? Well, if we got to force Gilhuli and we can't kill him, but there ain't no statute about kidnapping around here that I ever heard of. Only murder. Hmm. And as Gilhuli is crazy about this Marianne Marlowe... Well, you don't have to draw pictures. If we do that, we can force Gilhuli to sell and shut his mouth afterwards by pe telling the cattlemen that uh, uh, they're out to hang him because he made the sale. <laughs> now that's a good idea. Don't you think, Billings? Brilliant. <laughs> Billings Dwight was enough of a diplomat to let Fallon keep the change. He only nodded. Now let's see. Uh, uh, next Sunday she'll be home from that school and uh, nobody will be around. We'll walk in there and, oh, say, uh, we better get uh, Stogie and Carson to come along and help. Gahooly uh, might walk in. He goes and sees her on Sundays. Yeah, that's a good idea, Fallon. <laughs> It was Sunday morning, and the trees were singing, and the birds were shining, and the sun was in bloom, and Sir Gilhuli trotted along on ye calico toward ye towers of Marlow. He was black and blue all over from his encounters with Brian Dubois Gilbert, and the tin pail was dented badly, and was frying hot in the desert sun, but that made no difference. The bound copy of Ivanhoe was in his saddlebag, and Lady Marianne was due for a big and wondrous surprise. If this was being romantic, it was all right with Jigsaw Gilhooly. Sir Gilhooly arrived before the clabbered towers of Marlow, pointed his lance at the sizzling zenith, and cried, Hist, Lady Marianne, how now? The weather beaten old house remained quiet. Gilhooly raised his voice and repeated, <clears throat> His Lady Mary Ann, how now? And then in sudden doubt. Hey, hey Mary Ann, yeah, it's just me. <laughs> and still nothing happened. Puzzled, Gil Hooley said, You see anything of her, Calico? Calico stirred and swished at the flies. Gil Hooley got down, thrusting his lance into the earth. He went into the house and stood while his eyes adjusted themselves to the dim interior. And then his glance lighted upon a torn bit of gingham. A flood of unreasoning terror took him. He jumped to his feet and stared all about him. He went swiftly to the kitchen, and there he found a chair overturned. Just outside the back door, he saw that loose dust had been disturbed by long scrapes as though somebody had been dragged unwillingly across it. Hurrying on this trail, he came to a gulch and found that many horses had been there. 
He tried to count them, but he was too excited for accurate tracking. Disaster had come to the Marlowe Ranch, and that was all that Gil Hooley could register. He whistled excitedly for Caligo, and the pony came, tripping on his reins. Gil Hooley mounted with a rush and spurred around the house. He caught up his lance as he passed it, and then swerved back to catch the other trail. One horse had a notch gone from its shoe, and by this mark, Gil Hooley could follow on the trodden wagon trail. It's Fallon! It's that dirty sheep herder, Fallon! Before that and beyond that, he could not go. He accredited Fallon with no great strategy, but only remembered that Marianne Marlowe was a lovely girl much in demand, for some reason which had always been wondrous to Gil Hooley, given most of her time to one Jigs Gil Hooley. And because he had never been able to figure out why she was at all interested in him, he was now more than anxious than ever to prove up. And as he rode, he pictured what would happen to Fallon. Oh. But Gil Hooley completely forgot that he had left his six-gun home because he needed the empty holster for a lance couch. And he did not even have his Winchester rifle. Six men, probably. But the way Gil Hooley felt the six might have well have been 600. He balanced his lance and forgot to remember that a rifle bullet can reach a thousand yards with fair accuracy, whereas his lance, in the same length of time, could reach about 30 feet. He had only read Ivanhoe, so he did not know that chivalry had died as the bullet progressed. Fallon had a prospector's cabin perched precariously on a hillside. Three horses filed along the steep trail, picking their careful ways until they reached the flat ground behind the sad shack. Fallon eased his thick bulk to the ground ah! and grinned at Marianne. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, young lady, we'll take you in and leave you to set and uh, think a spell. You'd better watch out. If Jiggs tracks you to this place, he'll, he'll shoot that grin off your face and hang it on the wall. Fallon appreciated the brave, if empty, statement. He grinned more broadly. <laughs> yeah, well, you didn't see me, what me and Billin saw last week. Your honey lamb was out pushing a longhorn around with a long stick. <laughs> Mary Ann stared down at Fallon. He was what? <laughs> you heard me. Uh, he's been chewing on loco weed, sweetheart, and he's got as much chance of having you got as much chance of having him pry you out of this with bullets as he has of saying no to me now. Now you get inside and be quiet, and, and I'll go over and see if Gil Hooley will buy you back. Marianne had never any real reason to be sure of Gil Hooley. He might or might not be dumb, and he might or might not be brave, but she wanted very badly to believe that he was bright and brave, and so she said that he was, was in no uncertain terms. I tell you that he'll take you apart. You can't browbeat him into doing anything he doesn't want to do. You want his range, so you can get all the range for nothing when the next dry season comes. But Jiggs won't give in. Not him. You'd better start leaving the country before he hears about this outrage. <laughs> it's big talk. This afternoon, I think you'll find out just how brainy and brave this Gelhooli gent is. When he comes here, I will be leading him, and he will be as docile as a spring lamb. Marianne wanted to disbelieve that, but she was almost certain that it was true. Never in the career of Jiggs Gilhooley had anyone ever said that he was dangerous. And too late, she knew that she had accepted his attention to the exclusion of others merely because his company was usually so restful after a hard week's teaching. True, she had wanted him to be romantic, but... Fallon hauled her down off the horse, pushed her into the cabin, and shut the door. <laughs> well, how about it, Billings? Billings grinned. By the time the country gets warmed up about this, we'll have Gilhooley's ranch. And as soon as we get that, we'll get all the money we need. It's been promised. <laughs> Fallon turned his horse around and then mounted. <laughs> and now, uh, 
You stay here and keep an eye peeled. I'm going to ride over to Gilhooly's and ask for his signature. <laughs> this is too easy. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> Fallon spurred his Mustang up the trail and over the canyon edge to trot out across the sage-covered plain. He was in a very happy mood, as he had never been more certain of anything in his entire life. He rode about a mile before he saw the approaching horseman. Once in a while, a light flashed from bright metal, and suddenly Fallon knew that it was Gil Hooley. Huh. Well, he come right along after all. <laughs> Gil Hooley was coming, with all the speed that Fat Calico could thunder out of the road. He saw Fallon in the distance, and without slackening pace, narrowed the gap to a hundred yards. Then, he slowed to a walk, and Fallon slowed to a walk, and watchfully they approached each other. Where's Marianne? Fallon looked at the tin pail and the long pine stick and chuckled. <laughs> oh, she's safe enough. Uh, well, thanks for riding over, Gilhooly. You saved me the trouble of finding you. <laughs> what for? Why, if you'll sell the place and the water rights, You'll get back Mary Ann. It's just as easy as that. They were less than 100 feet apart now, both coming to a halt. <sighs> I, I got it figured out right. If I sell, you'll block off the wells. In the next dry season, you can buy the whole range for a song. The ranchers around here would be pretty mad at me, Fallon. It ain't a deal. No? Well, my boy... It is a deal. Uh, but the price is only $1,000 now. If you don't sell, well, I can't promise what will happen to Mary Ann Marlowe. You getting hard-boiled? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, mister. You asked for it. And before the startled Fallon could so much as blink, Gil Hooley quirted Calico and leveled the long lance and charged straight at Fallon. It was a terrifying thing to see that spear coming, but Fallon had plenty of time to draw, and draw he did. He snapped a quick and accurate shot at Gil Hooley's thigh, and the puncher was almost jerked out of his saddle, but the lance was still in line and still coming. With a thump, the lance slammed into Fallon in the chest, picked him off his Mustang, and threw him to the earth. The tip struck down. Doug saw it, and before Gil Hooley could free it, the pine was snapped in two sections with such force that he, too, was hurled from his saddle. He hit, rolling, and ended up not ten feet from Fallon, who was scrambling madly for his lost pistol. Gil Hooley dived, but he was too late. Fallon, bruised and blowing and mad, towered above the puncher. Pistol leveled. Funny, ain't ya? I ought to plug you. Gil Hooley sat still. His thigh was numb, and a hole in the bat wing chaps told him where the bullet had gone in. Ain't so full of ginger now, are ya? Gil Hooley glared through the slits in the water pail and said nothing. You changed your mind now, hmm? What else, what else can I do? Fallon relaxed a little and then grinned. He looked around to see his own pony fleeing for home. Calico, Gil Hooley's horse, was standing by and Fallon approached. Calico shied away, but Fallon got the rein. <laughs> you gonna leave me here? Nah. He mounted, and Calico laid back his ears and bucked. But Fallon quirted him into docility and almost broke his jaw with the bit. Nah, but I ain't gonna walk. Come on, puncher, march! But my, but my leg! Protested Gil Holy, trying to get up, and then he picked up a five-foot section of the broken lance and pried himself up from the earth. Using the pine as a crutch, he began to hitch himself along. Faster! I ain't got all day. Gil Hooley hippity hopped faster, head down. <laughs> oh, this is too easy. I never did think you had any guts, Gil Hooley. Uh, we'll go to my place and sign. But uh, I've cut the price. You'll only get five hundred dollars. <laughs> I can't pay you less without making it suspicious. That all right with you? Yeah. And after you've paid, uh, you can leave this country. Wouldn't be health healthy for you, understand? Gil Hooley didn't answer. He stumped dejectedly along, never turning to look at Fallon. They came at long last to the rim above the Callan, 
the cabin. Gilhooli was played out from loss of blood in the hot sun, and it was all he could do to make it down the trail to the dilapidated shack. Marianne was looking out the window at him. There was both pity and disappointment on her face, but there was no respect. For her, Gil Hooley had passed out of the reach of any respect. Oh, he looked so ridiculous with that pail on his head, and she judged that his wound would not be serious, or else he could not walk at all. She felt pity, and pity is the pallbearer of love. Fallon got down. Ah, yeah. Billings got up from a patch of shade and walked over, <laughs> gazing uh, amusedly at Gil Hooley. <laughs> well, he tried to get tough, uh, but I took the fight out of him. <laughs> Creased his leg, and you think I'd killed him. <laughs> Ain't that right, Gil Hooley? <laughs> Gil Hooley looked at the ground through the slits in the pail and said nothing. <laughs> Go on inside, and I'll said get. Fallon, booting Gil Hooley. Gil Hooley walked with difficulty through the door. There was a chair beside the table, and he sat down upon it, shoulders slumped in dejection. He would not look up to meet the contempt in Mary Ann's eyes. Fallon was joyously overbearing. He he hauled out some printed forms, some uh, ink, and a pen, and shoved them at Gil Hooley. Yeah, uh, and the more I think about it, the more I think. It would be a shame to spend any money on you, Gil Hooley. <laughs> Supposing we make this for uh, ten dollars. Is that all right? <laughs> Sorrowfully, Gil Hooley nodded. His hand was shaking when he picked up the pen. He dipped it in the ink and tried to make a mark with it. Fallon and Billings were grinning. <laughs> the pen would not write. Oh, whoa, whoa, I-, I got another one, stated Fallon with the air of a man of property. He turned around and rummaged in a box against the far wall. Gil Hooley was still half leaning on his crutch. Billings turned to watch Fallon search, and suddenly the cabin exploded. Billings saw the stick whip level, and he dived for his gun. But before he could draw, Hard Pine hit him between the eyes, and he was slammed sideways against Fallon. Gil Hooley and Fallon collided in the middle of the room. Fallon had no time to draw. Gil Hooley's fists were too swift. And Fallon's countering blows elicited yelps of pain from him. His knuckles were smashed against the improvised cask. Whirling, Fallon round with a left. Gil Hooley plucked the Colt from his holster and then, reversing its butt, began to get in some work. Oh, the cabin floor was covered with dust that now began to rise chokingly into the room. Through this fog of battle, Marianne, pressing a far wall with her back, saw a monster with a shining helmet take two men apart with such savage efficiency that it chilled her. Billings was out of it. He was a stumbling block on the floor. Gil Hooley's helmet had come off in the fray and now face streaked with sweat and eyes wild with battle, he advanced one final time upon the flailing fists of Fallon. There was a swift exchange of cracking blows and suddenly Fallon collapsed over Billings. Methodically, Gil Hooley reached down and yanked Fallon to his feet, only to knock him over again. Don't kill him! Gil Hooley picked Fallon up. He carried him to the water barrel and dumped him in upside down. Then he set the bedraggled sheep man in what was left of the chair. Slowly, Fallon came around. He looked up and saw Gil Hooley's set jaw and quail. Don't hit me again! You're dumb. You are the dumbest man I have ever met, in fact. How was I to know you wasn't hit? You wasn't square. Oh. Well, I'm being square now. Said the awful specter of fury, which was Gil Hooley. You want my place? Well, I'm going to sell you land, see? I'm going to sell you land, and it's going to cost you $1,500. You'll sell? Gil Hooley snatched the forms to him and grabbed the pen. He scrawled names and locations onto the dotted lines and then signed at the bottom. He reversed the paper and handed the pen. Fallon read, and what he read he thought must be distorted by his swelling eyes. But but, you're only selling me one acre of land. You're selling me one acre of land in the driest part of your land. You can't do this. I I won't... Gil Hooley's voice was quiet, but Gil Hooley's voice went through Fallon's head like a bullet. Sign and get the money. Fallon looked at Gil Hooley's face. 
And then Fallon signed. He stumbled over to the box against the back wall, dug out an iron container. Dolefully, he counted the contents and found $1,545. Gil Hooley snapped it out of his hands. The 45 bucks is ran on my horse. Now, uh, get out of here. Kick some life into that jet and travel. And don't never come near the Painted Buttes country no more. Mary Ann was watching with wide eyes. He came back and suddenly he picked her up and carried her out and put her on a horse. The two mounted, watching Gil Hooley for any swift move. And then almost gladly, they rode up the trail and out of sight. Oh, jeez. I'd never seen anything so wonderful in all my life. To fool them into thinking you were wounded and then getting them, beating them up and getting $1,545. Well, I didn't fool them, said Gil Hooley, tenderly regarding his leg. But, but say, you know that guy Ivanhoe? Oh, yes, Jiggs. He was a fake. What? Yeah. Why the dickens didn't you tell me that being romantic was just beating up guys with your bare fists? You'd have saved me a pile of trouble. <laughs>